Okay, we're back, we're live. This is Think Tech, a Community Matters, and we're gonna to talk today about a program that we're setting up for September 30th, 10 days away. And um, this program is called Burning National Issues, uh, Legal Chicken, Legal Egg. And for this discussion, we have two legal people, well, not to say whether the chicken or the egg. <laughs> There's a former dean of the William S. Richardson School of Law, uh, and a constitutional lawyer, Avi Seufer, and uh, Richard Walsgrove, and he is uh, runs the environmental department, if you will, at William S. Richardson School of Law, um, and they're both friends of ThinkTech. And I guess uh, I would I would start by saying good morning. Thank you for appearing on this preview of the chicken egg program. Morning, Jay. To Great it. to be here. So, Avi. <laughs> I'm sorry to have to ask you this question, but what are we talking about here with chicken and egg, legal chicken, legal egg? Well, I think uh, the implication may be that we have to uh, be careful and walk on egg eggshells, but we don't. <laughs> we get to say what we want, and we don't even have to argue about which came first uh, or crossing the road. And I think it's an intriguing title, as often is the case with what Jay Fidel comes up with. <laughs> Okay, and you're going to moderate the program. The program includes uh, Abortion in America with Kimi uh, Ide Foster, uh, uh, Gun Violence Prevention with Chris Marvin, um, The Challenges of Climate Change with uh, none other than uh, our present company, Richard Walsgrove, um, Voting Rights in America, uh, Sylvia Albert. Uh, she's joining us from Washington. She's in Common Cause. And um, Beyond Insurrection with your friend, uh, Jeff Portnoy. Uh, who may or may not be on a cruise ship sailing the oceans at that time. I want to see how that works. We are, we are coming from all directions on this. Um, so, um, Richard, you know, if you ask the School of Journalism, uh, in the Department of, what is it, the Journalism Program in the Communications Department at UH Manoa, what the most important story of our lifetime is, they will say without hesitation, climate change. That's what they will say. Now, there will be some people who don't agree, but uh, I think uh, they got a point there, don't they? Um, because this, this is a, an existential threat that we make all other threats, all other legal threats uh, irrelevant if we do not survive on the planet. Um, so, you know, you're in a special category here. And I guess uh, on the chicken egg level, what do you expect to cover it's an interesting framing i think the idea that climate change is an uh, existential threat does make it a little bit different but on the other hand it's a threat that doesn't seem like it's at hand right we it's not one of these threats that seems soon salient and certain to borrow other people's words um, and so part of what I think uh, is interesting to talk about on this issue particularly as it relates to things like abortion and gun regulation and voting rights and the right to future generations like we, we have with some of our colleagues here. I think that uh, what's interesting is in the legal egg, legal chicken, legal egg context is what comes next? I mean, how are we putting all of these pieces together in a coherent way that ultimately serves the public interest? That's what I always wanna talk about. How are we gonna fix things? Yeah, well, and you know, the fix work. You know, it's like one great big experiment on all of the topics that I mentioned and especially perhaps you, um, you know, you, you, you take a whack at it, you change the law, sometimes with great difficulty, you spend the money, sometimes with great difficulty, and then at the end of the day, you find it didn't work, and then you have to try again. Or you found it worked, but the effects were not exactly what you anticipated, and then you have to try again. It's, um, you know, it's an experiment, isn't it? Yeah, maybe it's an experiment. I mean, everything we do is an experiment, right? Because we, we don't know what comes tomorrow. But on the other hand, you know, if you think about climate change in, in fundamental terms, uh, Al Gore's got this great quote when he's talking about it, uh, even if he's unpopular in some circles. I think this particular quote, everybody can agree on, that we already know how to pull carbon dioxide out of the air. In fact, the most efficient way of doing it is a machine that we call a tree. And if we do that at scale, we call it a forest. And I don't know that 
allowing forests to grow where they're supposed to be is all that much of an experiment, really. It's maybe more about putting back things the way they were before we disrupted it with our experiments. <laughs> you know, I was telling you guys about Timothy Snyder, the history at Yale, and uh, he went through a whole hour of uh, orienting his uh, students about history. And then he said, I want you guys to give me one word that defines history, the, the, the essential word for history. And, you know, I figured it out. I got to tell you, I'm so happy with myself. I figured it out. The word he was looking for, which Richard alluded to, is change. It always changing. History is change. And, um, you know, the, the planet has changed, too. <laughs> it's changing, whether we like it or not. It's changing if we try to fix it or don't. And so, you know, you have, you have a challenge there. If I make you king, um, and I would like to do that. Uh, sorry, Avi. I mean, I like some other day I'd like to make you king. Oh, Richard, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you know, which is not easy, I mean, to be king these days and to have absolute power. Um, you know, you could think of things that would really help us on climate change. Um, what would be your approach on that, Richard? Well, here's your legal chicken and legal egg question, Jay, is that uh, right, it, the, the answer is pretty simple. Let's stop dumping carbon pollution into the air at rates that are unprecedented in, in human history and indeed, you know, a couple hundred million years of global history. Simple question if you're a king. But what would the what would the ramifications of that be, right? If people feel that we're overstepping our bounds, uh, I I read an uh, op-ed in the LA Times the other day, pushing back against the idea that we should change the cars we drive and stop burning gasoline, and the central argument was, I really like working on cars, and I can relate that. I'm, I'm I can relate to that. I'm a car guy too, and so uh, what I would want to do as king is to make sure we're taking account of those sort of fundamental rights that people have and that we cherish and that we hold and convincing folks it's not it's actually not a matter of waving a wand and changing things convincing folks that fixing this climate problem is in everybody's interest whether you're a car guy or not because i'm not going to be able to work on my car with my son if we are dealing with no food because we know we've ruined our global agricultural system mm -hmm. priorities yeah well i mean <clears throat> uh, in the end you've got to get the legislation through Kings don't, well, in some countries, they still have the power, but um, in a democracy, you've got to get it through, and we have trouble doing that. So, you know, Avi, uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about Richard's approach to this? Is it going to fit within the chicken and the egg? Well, I think his, uh, he's exactly right uh, about some of this being so obvious that even the current disputes about, you know, should we listen to science look silly uh, compared to what he said at the beginning, for example. Trees are good for the environment. Why don't we have more trees? I mean, that doesn't take a lot of faith in uh, sophisticated science to figure out. Now, there are always counter arguments, of course. And I think a key thing, and this gets back to what both of you have kind of at least pointed to, is that victory is not forever. So even if you were to win, uh, there's a great Faulkner quote which is whoever wins, it won't be for good and it won't be for long. And I think that's certainly true. So there is in law uh, a lot of evidence of that, in constitutional law even more, I would say. And that's kind of shocking to people that you don't get things settled. And they weren't settled by the framers and they weren't settled by the second constitution uh, after the Civil War. And they're not settled, let us hope, by the current Supreme Court. You know, not that it's directly relevant, but what I heard recently is the Constitution, as far as the uh, original language guys are concerned, um, has a fatal flaw. It, it never says that you have to read the Constitution in the... <laughs> I, know, I know you've heard this before. You have to read the Constitution uh, using the language of 1789 or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and if they were really smart, they would have said, you have to keep on reading the Constitution in the original context. Um, what do you think? Would that have improved things? Well, we, one of the things, one of the reasons that I go back to the Faulkner quote is, and this is something people don't realize, perhaps until they get to law school, let us hope they do 
uh, while they're in law school that you can win at the federal level and lose at the state level and vice versa. States have their own constitutions, uh, very different state by state. And so in that sense, it's a never ending dialogue or more than a dialogue, there are a lot of voices. Uh, so even if we read the original Philadelphia Constitution in the meaning it had, and, and one of the strange things about the current so-called textualists who seem to dominate the court is they pay no attention to history and they actually pay very little attention to the words as they meant something then, as they mean something now. And I've just noticed a new move that they've got, which is they call something a doctrine. And once they've pronounced something a doctrine, they can do whatever they want with it. And they, they can say, well, we're not doing anything about the text. We're just construing a doctrine. And they've done this in the environmental area in particular. There's the major question doctrine. Where did that come from? Where is that written down? It's not but it's what they use to try to limit the power of the EPA when it comes to our air. Um, so that's the latest. That was at the end of the last term. Is that, is that helpful to the cause of saving the planet, Richard? Uh, I, I have strong feelings about, about this particular doctrine, as, <laughs> as we're calling it now. Uh, it's, I think there's, a, there's something bigger going on, and it's, a, it's another legal chicken, legal egg. It's the abdication of judicial responsibility, and it's not just happening at the Supreme Court, and it's not just the West Virginia case that Avi just mentioned, and not just the major questions doctrine. We've got court after court after court saying climate change is such a big deal, we can only solve it by deferring to legislators. Never mind the fact that we had legislation, what, 50 years ago now that said, protect our, protect our air, please, Environmental Protection Agency. The legislation is there. I think, I think we're seeing... Uh, a really tragic breakdown of our judicial system. Well, there's a particular case that I think Richard may have in mind, a Ninth Circuit decision, and it was a very important doctrine developed by a federal district court judge in Oregon, and she said, we got to take into account future generations, and they have standing, and we have to take into account uh, their interests as well as people who are around now. And it was a very peculiar Ninth Circuit decision with a very courageous district court judge who dissented, uh, even though she's just a district court judge sitting uh, by designation. She's not there most of the time. And the judge who wrote it is a judge I largely admire, and he's someone I've known for a long time, Andy Hurwitz. And he basically, as she said, walked right up to the edge, and then he said, oh, there's nothing we can do about this. Well, we know that the judges often have complex problems to remedy. They don't remedy them all, but all the time they're in there pitching. And it was really striking and scary that he advocated, as, as Richard just said. Well, you know, maybe that's part of the chicken egg thing in the sense that you have all these factors going on. You have this deterioration from whatever source, whatever source. I mean, it could be natural deterioration. It could be social deterioration. It could be technological effect deterioration. But then you have the law too. The law is also a changing factor. And you throw them all in, you know, in, in the hopper and what do you get these days? You get chaos. And, um, and I, I asked, uh, you know, your colleague, uh, Kimi Ide Foster, uh, what happens after chaos? Does chaos lead to order? <laughs> Anybody got an answer on that? She said, she said chaos leads to chaos that is worse. <laughs> you know, chaos comes in gradations, you know. <laughs> I don't think that's what they mean by chaos theory, though. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, you know, what is the, you know, underlying theme, as you see it now, you can change your mind, Avi, um, of, you know, moderating this program. Because, you know, just to repeat, we got abortion issues, we got gun violence issues, we got climate change, we got voting rights, and we got insurrection. We could have picked others, but those are the five that seem to be most poignant right now. But, you know, do you have a thought about what the, you know, the, the common denominator is in, in addressing um, the changes, uh, the chicken egg issues, uh, the chaos possibilities for those five? Well, I, I think, uh, and I may differ from Richard on this, um, that our, our essential problem in some ways is paying too much attention to the Supreme Court. And parallel to that or linked to that is the Supreme Court paying too little attention to what the impact of their decisions is, which they ought to do, and which many justices over a long time 
has said they are doing. This court says we don't care. And I think, uh, as we are seeing, uh, the abortion decision is a prime example where there was Chief Justice Roberts, uh, who is not a hero when it comes to voting rights, for example, a very activist judge, if you will. But he was trying to say, hey, not so fast, right? I don't, I'm going to say that Mississippi law is okay, but this is going to have consequences. And the current majority just plowed ahead. And they, I think, are influencing the next election by doing that. And that wasn't hard to see as something that was going to be a consequence. And so, you know, for good or ill, I mean, it's not to say the court should always follow the public. Sometimes it should lead the public. Brown versus Board of Education is the classic example. But even there, they pay too much attention, perhaps, to public response with the, what's called Brown II. The implementation wasn't really there. That, I think, comes out on Richard's side of abdication. Instead of just trying to do it in Brown II, they said, well, local conditions and all deliberate speed, famously or infamously, which really allowed the buildup of Southern resistance. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's some people think, uh, Richard, that, you know, the, the social compact is torn here, um, that, you know, people do not understand. Um, and, um, and then, you know, the, the government, including the courts, um, are disconnected. They don't understand what people want. And they don't understand, as Avi suggests, about leadership. And I, you know, what's um, really interesting, we, we did a survey on Mar-a-Lago. And uh, to summarize in general the results of the survey, um, I guess you would say maybe 25-30% um, of the people said, you know, Trump may be right. He may be entitled to keep those documents or to hold them. It's incredible. I, I really don't know who was on the survey, but that's extraordinary. And uh, another, mm, you know, ten percent or so um, said, uh, mm, I, I forget what they said. And the and the balance though said it's too early to tell. It's too early, really. And it's been in the press for about a month. It's too early to tell. So what you know, what you get out of that is is that people um, do not read and understand what's going on in the world. And then you take the legal, you know, the government, the legal apparatus that's supposed to deal with this, and you find they're disconnected. They're disconnected even from that. So I think we already have a kind of version of, of chaos. And I think it's particularly appropriate to, to look at it through the, the lens of climate change. Um, not only is it existential threat, but I mean, people don't seem to care about it, even though it will ultimately affect all of us. Um, and uh, we can't seem to get all the necessary legislation through. Um, and there's a disconnect um, between the reality and the government. And there's also a disconnect between the people and the reality. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I think I have to go have lunch now. Um, but... <laughs> How do you how do you reconcile all of that? Is that one for me, Jay? He wants um, to know what to have for lunch: chicken, egg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, Jay. I think there's a thread here, so I'll plant a seed with Avi uh, in his moderator role. And I think the thread here is that if we're seeing chaos in the sort of the, the, the public and governmental understanding of climate change and the solutions to it and how easy or hard they are and how beneficial they are, how costly they are, who, who they cost and who, who it'll impose costs on and who it won't, none of that is an accident. That, that was an intentional public relations campaign. We've, where the documents are coming out every day, right? Of the oil industry being sued. The documents come out how there's been... And an, an effort to hide these facts, to obscure the facts, to have folks misunderstand the science, to diminish the sort of importance of the science. And so uh, I, I wonder, the question for Avi and the other panelists, I wonder how much of that sort of PR work is, is in affecting these other issues. Why do we call it gun control? That sounds really scary. Last time I checked, the Second, Second Amendment talked about regulation. So why aren't we calling it gun regulation? Who's making those decisions for us? I really feel that the way we talk about these things is not given enough attention. And I'm not afraid of the chaos. We can unwind it. People have done this before. We, you know, we, we as a, a humanity have been through difficult times and difficult issues. But if we keep lying to ourselves and we keep allowing people to lie to us just because they want to make a buck, that's a tough one to, to reconcile. Mm, yeah, the nomenclature is everything. And that means the media, isn't it? 
that the media often picks the nomenclature. And um, if you were monarch, if you were king, what would you say to the media about climate change, for example? But it's also, um, and maybe gun safety is better than gun regulation in terms of the public response. Well, well um, Chris Marvin is, is calling it gun violence prevention. Yeah, That's what right. he's calling it. Yeah, and he's very good. So tune in to see Chris Marvin <laughs> as well as everyone else. Uh, one of the things that has struck me, I just published something about this last week, an op-ed that is. Um, so everyone's running around talking about their fundamental rights. One example being Second Amendment rights. The Second Amendment was not recognized to protect individual rights until Scalia, there's a very strange reading of the Second Amendment, said, I'm not going to talk about the first clause, only the second clause, and overruled over well over 100 years of Supreme Court precedent, including very conservative courts. Everybody now is running around saying, oh, yeah, Second Amendment rights, like they've always been here, they're fundamental. Another example, and this is what I wrote about, um, there's the fundamental right of parents, right? And that's all over politics these days and school boards and so on. Well, where is that fundamental constitutional right? There's no mention of parents. There's no mention of children or of education in the Constitution. And where it lies, if you really want to trace it back, is to substantive due process, the very doctrine that the Did you use said, the term doctrine, by the way? The very doctrine that the court said was illegal, irrelevant, wrong, and egregiously so in Dobbs, in the abortion decision. You can't use substantive due process to protect a woman's right to choose, but you can use it for parental rights, which gets back to the 1920s. So nobody's actually serious of, is it in the Constitution? They're just running around saying, oh, we have these rights. Now, I'm not saying parents shouldn't have rights and children shouldn't have rights. But the Constitution is not the only source. And if to go back to your example of read the Constitution, you should read the Constitution and you would discover it's not there. Therefore, you're making an argument which may or may not uh, be one consistent to talk about in our full discussion about something that's so basic, as Richard has been talking about, that you don't actually need specific constitutional language. No, you don't. Not to have a free society. Uh, you, you know, you take advantage of all the morality that's been expressed by the courts for 230 years. Um, you know, one thing about the media, Avi, I, I noticed an article in the, I think it was the Times in the last couple of days, about how there was a case wending its way to the Supreme Court, uh, where they were expected, where they are expected to opine on social media. And, and the tension is between freedom of the press and essentially censorship for arguably the benefit of, of, of truth. Um, and this is really, really, really interesting because, uh, you know, it's, it's, and I hope, Richard, that you'll agree with me, uh, that we cannot be confident that the Supreme Court will do the right thing. Um, it, we cannot be confident. God knows what they're going to do. Um, and so we have, we have a, a, a maybe a very profound change in the way information is delivered uh, to a good part of our population who stands on the street corner looking at their telephones and getting all their information, all their opinion, all their thought process out of a phone that is, I don't want to say unregulated, but that could be regulated in a different way once this court gets its hands on it. Um, we don't have freedom of the press on our list. You know, but made, maybe in a funny way, it's there for every single item on our list of issues, don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, to the extent that I'm saying the way we talk about these things matters, that the journalism is is a mouthpiece for all of that. I, I don't know that I have this. I, I wonder how much the sort of social media era is a flash in the pan and is a natural, natural function of our technology. Uh, it makes sense to me that we may have to find new ways to regulate that but some of the key principles don't change, right? You can say what you want, where you want, the government can't interfere. But if I'm using somebody's private platform, why, why is the Supreme Court opining about that? Why is the Texas legislature opining about that? Is it because we're afraid of what people have to say? Well, we've always been afraid of what people have to say, right? Well, how did the world work when there was no social media, when one person got to decide what goes into the textbook and what doesn't? I think that's just as scary. We figured it out then, we can figure it out in the future. 
Yeah, one scary part about uh, the Ken Burns uh, series on the Holocaust, on what was going on in Germany in the 30s, is the book burning. Um, he has footage you have never seen before about the book burning uh, in all the communities that he controlled. And, you know, after a time, he controlled a lot more communities than he did at the beginning. And what he did, for example, Kristallnacht, he did in all the communities that he controlled. It was more, more, much more than Germany. And so the book burning was much more than Germany. Um, and he's been, Ken Burns spent a fair amount of time on that. And when you, you think about these school board actions, uh, particularly in the red states and the south, uh, you know, courtesy of the GOP, uh, and how they're taking all the books off the library, out of the libraries. You say, gee, you know, is there a parallel? Is there a parallel we should discuss, Avi? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> uh, well, these, are, these are, I think, uh, tricky issues. And one of the reasons they're tricky issues is the text of the Constitution doesn't resolve them. To the extent it does, it was entirely ignored by the Supreme Court and Citizens United, where they said, oh, press, corporations, they can make money. Therefore, they went along with money is expression and therefore shouldn't be regulated. Well, there's a problem in that syllogism. And one of the problems is the text of the Constitution actually does protect the press, but not corporate spending. Uh, and this is, I think Citizens United has a lot to do with our current problems, actually. And they have not only not narrowed it they have been expanding it uh year after year and it's just shocking how much money now talks which gets back to what richard said at the beginning you know i i'm sure that we've all revered the supreme court for most of our professional lives and thought that they you know they sure they make mistakes once in a while and they take the wrong position once in a while but essentially they walk on water i mean up to a point and now we find that, you know, you walk through those hallowed halls there, yeah, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, um, and you find that they, they don't actually understand the concept of, of corporations. I mean, I'm here to tell you corporations are not people in the sense they define that in Citizens United, mm -hmm. nor, nor um, did they think about the consequences of their actions. I mean, any Yonkel, and I, I mean that in the broadest possible term, any Yonkel could see at the moment that decision came out that it was going to be problematic. But this court didn't see that. Yeah. So they didn't understand the law, the concept that we all learned or should have learned in law school, and they didn't look at the consequences. So I, you know, myself, I have, as you know, I don't have a lot of confidence in their decision process going forward. And if you're looking for a common denominator, am I right? The Supreme Court is the common denominator for all of these issues. So many of these issues that we're talking about are going to wind up um, in that courtroom. Yeah. Well, certainly they gets talked about a lot. I think that's an important f function of the Supreme Court as we talk about those decisions, even when a decision from a circuit court or another court might be as important or more important. They, uh, again, they have been playing games, I think, and they're very uh, significant, if not deadly games in some of these matters. And I think you can find their fingerprints these days all over some of our greatest social problems. I think I have to disagree with Jay for once uh, about- Okay, it happened, it happened before too, I can tell you. The reverence for the court, uh, which I think is accurate, in terms of our upbringing, but ought not to be. Uh, the court has been pretty bad for most of our history and particularly about things like race. You know, one of the things that um, in saying, well, it's not in the text in Dobbs in the abortion decision, there is a slight uh, exception that uh, might be allowed, says Alito, and that is for deeply rooted concepts, deeply rooted concepts in our tradition. But what's the, one of the most deeply rooted concepts of all? Racism. That's not what he's talking about. And racism, the, the court has been at least complicit in the growth of Jim Crow and legitimacy, you know, and, and racism throughout most of our history. Well, to talk about Dobbs for a minute, you know, I think that hits it right on the chicken and egg piece. So you have the court throwing out Roe v. Wade. 
Okay, everybody disappointed. You, all of a sudden, women had lost rights. People have lost rights. That that hasn't happened a whole lot, where you have them one day and they go away the next. Um, and the extraordinary thing is that they throw it into the uh, the states and let the states decide. You know, this kind of perverse federalism. Um, and so now you have chaos, and you have the states doing the strangest things. And now um, you have an egg. It's an egg. Okay, now you have to have the chicken come back. And the chicken has to fix the egg. Um, but it's hard to fix the egg because the egg is different in 50 places. Um, so so does, wait, this, okay. does, this, does this help you, Avi, or not? Just be, just be careful here because a little biology. So you have the sperm and the egg, and maybe this is not where you want to go with your metaphor, Jay. <laughs> Um, what, I mean, you have, you're right, bizarre thing. I mean, Lindsey Graham wants to federalize, right, a particular rule. I mean, this is not our federalism of state sovereignty and states' rights. It's the opposite. So you have the switching of sides uh, about the issue as they see it, but no concern whatsoever for consistency. And it isn't just the court, uh, I guess I should say. It's also, and this is kind of where you let off, it is our institutions, and it's certainly you know, people think the filibuster is constitutionally required. That's nonsense. It's not, it's not constitutionally required at all. But there we have complete gridlock because the filibuster is so much honored. And the filibuster, of course, was primarily for racist reasons that we have this hold on what a more enlightened Senate might do. Richard, do you find this as provocative as I do? I, these issues are fascinating. I uh, maybe unlike uh, Avi, the the chicken and the egg uh, to me is, is working in a lot of ways, but in some ways I don't know that it's a reaction, an action reaction sort of thing. I think it might be that uh, you know it, we you adopt a position based on federalism, say, or perhaps based on textualism. Pick your poison there, um, and then all of a sudden you've got an egg, and the chicken that grows from it is not the chicken you wanted because federalism isn't getting you the political outcome you wanted. Textualism isn't giving you the decision about you know, the administrative power of the Environmental Protection Agency. So what do you do when the chicken you get from the egg isn't the chicken you thought you laid? I think that's, that's what I want to figure out. That's provocative to me. <laughs> oh, I mean, we are so looking forward to this program. We may have trouble. <laughs> But don't do the don't, don't do the egg in the abortion context, please. Jay. <laughs> Thank you for that. You're welcome. Avi Soifer, Richard Walsgrove, two of the players, uh, important players in our program called National Burning Issues: Legal Chicken, Legal Egg, on September 30 uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, all over the world and to examine, to see just exactly what our condition is and what it's likely to be going forward. Uh, thank you both, gentlemen. Thanks, Jay. Great fun. Thanks. Thanks. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.